Public Works and Safety Committee uh, <coughs> meeting to order. Anyone that, that would like to speak today, uh, please raise your hand. You can be recognized. You will have to, up to five minutes to talk, and your uh, co your public comments are welcome. Roll call. Roll call. Kang. Here. Walker. Here. Letta. Here. Marshall. Here. Gilbrook. Here. Here. Item number one is an update on the Rosedale Transit Route, Emory Cross. Commissioner, thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, last budget session in 2013, the Commission gave... Oh, I need to stop. First, I apologize. Okay. I need approval of the December 16th uh, meeting minutes. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by, by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the same sign. Ayes have it. Now, Emrick, you're up. All right. Thanks, sir. Uh, in the last budget... Wait, wait, wait. Oh. Agendas are in the back. Okay, thank you. One more time. Third time's charm. You promise? I promise. <laughs> in the last uh, budget session last year in 2013, the commission basically charged transit with a couple of things, running a new route proposal in uh, a new route proposed in the Rosedale area, basically running from Rosedale to Argentine and vice versa, and the uh, commission allocated $140,000 at that time for that project. Uh, to do that, uh, we have hired Mark Swope with Olson & Associates to do a quick route analysis, and he did a great job short amount of time to uh, turn around the information that we've needed. Since we've done the analysis, uh, we have learned that $140,000 is probably going to get us about six months of operating time uh, with the ATA running the route in 2014. I know the commission wanted us to start the route in early 2014, maybe even as early as January. That's not going to be possible. However, we have $140,000 for six months in 2014. What we're recommending at this time is that we start the route July 1st, so the route runs through the rest, the second half of 2014, and we don't start the route April 1st of 2014 because it would then end in October of 2014. This way, uh, it will give us time to go through another budget cycle and if we choose to extend to uh, if we choose to keep the route, keep operating the route in 2015, that'll give us enough time and enough information at that point to do so. Do, do is everyone on the commission understand what he's saying? Well, I, I think the concern is is to start a bus route and then to stop it because it's short of funding. And if we go through another budget cycle, we can start and have a six month window. And as we do our budget, then we can fund it fully for next year. Yes. And ideally in transit, it, it would be good to start it in the spring or in the summer. Ideally, you don't want to start in January because of low ridership anyway. If we start July 1st, we have plenty of time to identify all the bus stops up and down the corridor and everything, all the amenities that will be needed and associated with the route to get them in place and get them ready to go. Uh, the ATA needs about up to two months of lead time to go through their union process. Uh, to get the route on schedule, schedule the route out and uh, have the, uh, have the uh, capital, the buses ready to go and be ready for the route to operate. Commissioner, can you? Yes. Can't we also approach it from the standpoint of, uh, you know, the reason we're doing this is, you know, it is, is because people need the, need the transportation. And the sooner we get it to them, the better. Now, we will have completed not only our actual budget, but our amended budget uh, by the time the money runs out, if we start in April. And if we're not going to fund it again, we might as well, uh, you know, kill it rather than kill it in the middle of winter. Um, I, I guess my attitude is uh, uh, an amended budget item will undoubtedly have to be prepared, same as a budget item. The question is, are we going to be willing to fund it by an amendment to the budget for the additional $80,000 $80, to, to complete the rest of the year before the next year begins? I'm assuming that we will, but if we won't, then <coughs> we've saved that we've, 
We don't have to, f you know, it ends in October. Correct. I, I mean, that's another way to look at it. I'm just suggesting that as an alternative. Absolutely. I mean, it's not important to us. But I mean, it's okay for all of us because we got cars. It's the people who don't have buses that are going without for another three months during the spring and the summer when you know, they, they have lives to live. So I guess I'm not as concerned about starting in April unless it's just logistically impossible to do that. So you're Point saying eight. start in April and then if we needed to, we, to get the more budget money, we do an amendment this year, right? Exactly. Make sure I'm following you. Thank exactly. You. That makes sense. Unless there's some reason that we're not going to want to do an amendment to the budget. We have the administrator here. I don't know if we have anybody from finance. Well, I, part of the problem is is finding the eighty thousand dollars, and I agree with you. I want to start it as soon as we can, but I think once we start it, we need to fund it from here on out. And and I don't want to. Uh, I don't know if we can find the eighty thousand dollars for for this year, but I really think that that the goal should be is once we start providing the service that there's no interrupted service and it's continued, and we plan every year for it. You know, so that's part of my concern. But you know, so, what are you what are you asking for tonight? Well, there's there's no action requested. This is more of an informational update to discuss these options. And when are we going to move on this? Then, in the uh, don't we have to either approve or reject this and send it up to the full commission? What if if you if we uh, at this point, the way I understand it, due to the new UG financial policy. If we need to approve the eighty thousand dollars, then that has to go to the full commission. But if we decide to do it in in starting in June or July, I can't remember which month, then we don't have to go, go back July. We don't have to go back to the commission. We just start it, and then we plan for next year's whole whole year to budget for busing. Yes, and it could be addressed in the budget cycle, as Commissioner Walker stated. Commissioner Kane, I, I really do uh, agree with you as far as starting and stopping. I mean, because you start it and then people become dependent on something, and then you pull it away from them. I don't feel I don't feel good about that. I don't know. And as far as coming up with another eighty thousand dollars, I don't know either on that. And, and I could go either way. It's just it's 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 hard enough. To, to fund the bus system this first six months. And, and I, I, in, in my mind, I think we're better off starting in July, let them do it, and then next year say, here's the full year's funding so everyone knows that this bus system is going to happen from here on out, or as long as we can fund it. Yeah, I would, I would like them to be able to believe that they can depend on us once we start something, that we'll stay with it as long as we can, you know, if it's something that we can afford to and need to do. Would it be best for you guys if we went ahead and made a motion to start in July? That way we, that way we can start planning right. and, and, uh, and uh, using that as our start date with, with public relations and marketing, as well as the uh, infrastructure that needs to be in place for July 1. Okay, I accept a motion. Are there any more questions? I move that we start. Is there a second? In second. July. Okay, there's a, a, a motion and a second. Roll call. Roll call, Kane. Aye. Walker. Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next up is Bill Heatherman, and I assume Bob Roddy's going to step to the table with this. Isn't that right, Bob? Bill Heatherman with Public Works. Thank you, Chairman Kane. Bob is handing out uh, extra copies of the attachment to this item. This is, again, just regarding the goals and the CMIP process. In December, we informed you that the Mid-America Regional Council federal application processes would be kicking off soon. Uh, we still expect to have the call for projects later this month with applications due in March. Um, we have understand the committee's desire to be involved in these discussions and to see an earlier start to the CMIP process. So this is our second presentation on the upcoming federal application rounds. 
what we have attached is a list of candidates. Typically, the Public Works Department maintains an overall view of the projects that have gone through some level of pre-planning or had been proposed, maybe is already in the CMIP or had been proposed for the CMIP in years earlier, particularly related to those projects that meet the criteria um, for federal funding under the different funding pots. Having said that, this list is intended to get the discussion started. If you are aware of other projects that you would like staff to look at, this would be a great opportunity to share those with us. Or if you'd like information about why we propose this particular list as our starting point for evaluations, I could explain that. Um, and I can also touch base on the fact that the Mid-America Regional Council process is an important piece of the federal funding, but it is by no means the only way that KDOT or the feds make infrastructure investments in the county. And there's several other very high profile big ticket projects that are either going on now or will be going on in the future. And if you're interested in a status update on those, I can share that also. So what Bob handed out is the list of projects and I can uh, walk through those um, and explain the rationale that we used to arrive at that. I'll draw your attention to the disclaimer at the bottom though first. Um, these are just some of the above projects. Uh, this list even in and of itself is substantially more project work than we would have a realistic expectation to get. So it's by no means the minimum list. We wouldn't be able to apply and succeed for, our, for even this list of projects. Um, it doesn't include Edwardsville and Bonner Springs because entities make applications as cities and uh, we remain available to evaluate any other project locations that someone might propose and compare that to the eligibility criteria for the grant. So before I dive into a discussion of the list, does anyone have general questions? Mr. Maddox? Or I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Kane, if, if you'd like to have some general questions before we go in. Do you have any? Do you want to go through the list? Okay. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and read the list, Bob? Okay. The Surface Transportation Program, which is the largest uh, funding category, um, typically funds arterial roadways and bridges. That, that's the type of project those are meant for. Uh, 65th Street and Riverview Avenue both had emergency bridge repairs. We would like to um, move forward on getting those bridges replaced. Uh, 65th is the more straightforward bridge replacement and doesn't have as many development related implications. So we'd propose to consider that as one that's uh, a good candidate for federal funding. Isn't that bridge eligible for TIF? Because the Turner Woods development project, are we talking about the We're talking, one? we're actually, we're talking about the other bridge, the, the next bridge to the east on uh, Turner Diagonal at 65th Street. One of them is Riverview and one of them is 65th. Ri Riverview is the one that came up for the discussion in the recent Socrates project. Right. But, it, but either, either or both, if you had a big enough project, it could be a TIF expense. Yeah, I, and that's why I'm questioning whether we should put any, whether this is the one that would require priority attention compared to something else where we're not going to have the possibility of TIF ever. Okay, and, and I think the best thing for me tonight is just take note of the comments and questions that are raised because we have an awful lot of additional work before we make the final uh, recommendation. And it's just a thought. We don't, we don't have that project in, in, in hand. That's but correct. But it could be done by TIF dollars rather than by <coughs> these funds if we could allocate them where we can't use TIF. That's correct, sir. And then the other four projects uh, that we've thrown out are our various major roadway corridors that are either in the CMIP now or have had some level of uh, specific visioning or discussion recently. Uh, Leavenworth Road, Central Avenue, Minnesota, and Rainbow and 7th Street. And I'd stand open to any other suggestions. I do want to point out on Leavenworth Road, we are by, by no means uh, suggesting that we could do all of I-635 to 91st that needs to be done. What we would suggest is that that corridor is um, not seeing the same level of investment as its sister state in parallel, and we would start somewhere and kind of keep growing out from there. Uh, Central is actually in the CMIP currently. Uh, this might be a way of leveraging additional funds. Minnesota Avenue would be the completion of the downtown to the same 
standard that was completed in the uh, transit project for the half block on either side of 7th. And then Rainbow 7th Street, actually that would be if the city were to elect to upgrade that transit route. You'll notice several transit projects here. At one point, a month ago, we let you know that there was some discussion about setting aside a minimum 15% for transit that was being discussed at the Mid-America Regional Council level. And so we were looking to make sure that we had some candidates of our own for transit should that policy be adopted regionally. However, uh, that request has been dropped. The committee that was promoting that 15% um, has, has asked that it not be implemented in that manner. So there isn't that issue to deal with in this upcoming funding round. And we can talk about that additionally if you like. But the, the bottom line is the rules are just all the projects compete. They each have a uh, scoring system. And transit projects certainly are eligible projects, but they're not going to impose a minimum goal or quota. We're talking about a larger project than a sort of grind and overlay. That is so correct. I just want to clarify that because I think maybe not all of our commissioners have discussed their roads as often as I have. <laughs> so it's sort of a different feel. Right. This is the kind of makeover level um, investments that, these, that this particular federal funding uh, pot is designed to provide federal funds to. At the, at the MARC level, there's several factors. Some of them are core transportation. So what's the annual daily traffic? What's the accident history look like on a road? How many lanes is the road? What type of adjacent development is it serving? Uh, another big section is, I guess, what they'd call the creating quality places aspect, which is, you know, is this a redevelopment area? Is this a historical roadway with a, um, you know, say environmental justice issues or economic redevelopment opportunities, you're going to get more points in the MARC scoring system when you're showing projects that do the kind of reinvestment that frankly we have an oper a lot of opportunity to do uh, versus say, you know, purely a capacity building project where you're just adding lanes. And if you want, I can hit on some of the others that are on this list, and then we can take some more questions. Transportation Alternatives Program is a combination of what used to be several separate pots of money, safe routes to school being one, and what they call transportation enhancement for trails. They've, they've lumped that all together to compete for one uh, federal set-aside program. So we have our safe routes to school, which we would continue proposing. The specific schools here are actually the ones that the school districts and the principals have kind of brought up to our attention. In the Safe Routes program, you have to do more than just build the sidewalk. You have to create the education and outreach programs. And what we found is we need the schools to be on board before we come and propose sidewalks. That is not to say that other schools beyond those listed couldn't be considered, particularly if the school district um, requested and, and, and wanted to see that happen. Uh, bike routes, as you know, there's an infrastructure action team that's an outgrowth of the Healthy Community Wyandotte Initiative. They've actually been working quite hard on a various recommendations. They have a recommendation that I think they've been making appointments to meet with different commissioners that's focused on what they'd call the transportation routes, the ones where people might actually use to get to work and back. And then they are going to be starting a separate set of recommendations for recreational focused uh, trail options. If the committee uh, wished to see us move forward on kind of making a down payment on the, on the, the bike type commuter projects, um, they're working on a recommendation to the city. And it would probably be a, a corridor where you could do striping and signage without needing to do a lot of other uh, disruption or impact. Um, so we've left a placeholder for a project of that type. Those compete extremely well in this funding category. And then um, State Avenue, uh, 
bike and pedestrian trail continuation from Sporting to 130th. That's a project application that we already worked on and submitted once and we're um, actually got so much money that we couldn't take uh, all of it and meet our local shares. But we still have that application and we could move quickly on it. And then the last, congestion mitigation, air quality, those tend to be intersections, traffic congestion, or other miscellaneous projects. Uh, 18th and Central intersection itself, the Five Lake at intersection, uh, 7th Street commuter bike route, which would be um, the last connection up to the US 69 bridges, or possibly things like transit vehicle upgrades. Uh, this particular funding program has a little more flexibility for some of those fleet type issues. So with that, I'd open it up to any comments or questions. Thank you. Uh, up under transportation alternatives program, um, I don't see William Allen White. I know, Bill, I spoke with you in the past about driving that way frequently and seeing young people who have to walk down in ditches and different stuff. So I know that you said the school district bought these sites forward, but what role do we play in possibly putting, you know, different schools and names on there sure. as well? Well, reminding me of it is, is a good start. So I'm going to note it down and we will talk with the school district, but certainly if, if the principal and the school districts are interested in any particular area, that, that helps. So by, by all means, feel free to have your own conversation with your constituents. But that's a good point. I should have actually probably had that on there already. Right. It's pretty unsafe because if it's snow or ice on that street, kids don't have sidewalk, and again, they're walking down in the ditches or in people's yards. And I'm just I'm just surprised that something hasn't been done by now because William Allen White's been there for a while and it's right next to West okay. West Middle School, which is another school. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I just would I, like to I reinforce. Agree with Commissioner Maddox. That was one on my list too. Right. Uh, it, it's one of the. I haven't seen all the schools. It's one of the worst though. Right. And it, it certainly could use the attention. I would just like to reinforce what Bill said. It's essential that the school and the principal get online because we can't force it down and they have to they have to be active participants in the whole process or it won't go on the uh, on the one for Oak Grove Elementary I know that uh, the bond passed to rebuild the school and I would hope that if it does end up on the list that nothing is really done until after the construction is done so that we don't have the construction vehicles tearing up new new construction for that area well, yes. either that or it'd be done in conjunction and be built at the same time. And, and actually on that, that's that's kind of a, a case of good things coming together from multiple directions. The Oak Grove Street Reconstruction is an authorized CMIP project, and so we were going to be building the sidewalk up the street itself. The school district has, with their remodeling or redevelopment, can make better internal connectivity. And so this might be then reaching those sidewalks out into the neighborhood and really transforming that school from one that you would never walk to right now to one that could actually um, have that. I forget the name of the school too. It may not be eligible. Um, I've talked to you about it where... Noble side, Prentice? Yeah, where the sidewalk, we just stopped in the middle of the... We ran out of money, I think is what I was told. And that sidewalk needs to be completed down to that school. It's, it's utterly useless right You're now. You're talking about 14th Street? 14th, I think it's Noble Prentice. Noble Prentice. The, the issue on Noble Prentice is the terrain gets extremely difficult. So um, I, I would certainly make a note that Noble Prentice is another school that we should look at. Any other questions by quick commissioners? We do this, so we have this master plan for sidewalks that includes sort of a bus route component. Um, I just sort of feel like we did this master plan for sidewalks and then we're not doing anything with it. So I'm, I'm wondering if that's an option for that. Um, I, I will have to relook at it. Regular sidewalk extensions by themselves uh, wasn't really the focus, but all of those safe routes to school projects are sidewalk projects at their core. Um, and then the others tend to lean towards more regional type bike uh, and pedestrian recreational facilities as opposed to just regular sidewalks. Can you say a little bit more um, about the congestion mitigation air quality section? 
I, I can. Let me do one thing real quick, though. However, Ms. Barkley, for example, Leavenworth Road enhancements, that in order to get sidewalks on Leavenworth Road, you have to transform the road pretty dramatically. So effectively, that's a case of using federal money to make sidewalks possible um, where they wouldn't otherwise be. So I think we are working to use these funds in a way that advance the complete streets philosophy and the sidewalk and trail plan. And then as far as congestion mitigation air quality, you have to go through a much more rigorous point system to basically demonstrate how much air pollution is being removed, how much uh, reduction in congestion there is. So there's kind of a very limited subset of project types that tend to score well. Uh, traffic signalized intersections with lots of congestion issues score well. Some of the bike trail projects score well. Maybe they shouldn't, but they do. And so it's kind of a way to slip a few in. And then anything that invests in transit, as long as it's an, edru an eligible federal expense, and you can show that the transit ridership would help offset car trips, tends to score well in that category. This meeting's adjourned, and we will now turn it over to the Administration and Human Service Standing Committee. Commission. Welcome to this exciting installment of the Administration and Human Services Standing Committee. Clerk, if you would call the roll. Roll call, Markley. Here. Walker. Here. Meadow. Here. Kenny. Here. Silver. Here. Fabulous. I need a motion and second for approval of the Standing Committee minutes. Move to approve for December 16th, uh, minutes. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Fabulous. We will move on to our agenda, and um, the first thing we have is a presentation by Joe Connor regarding acceptance of CAC incentive funds. I told Joe during um, a gender review that I love that every time he comes to us, he's asking us to approve him getting money. <laughs> That's one of the few people we can say that about, so we appreciate it. Go well, ahead. every time's a stretch, but thank you, <laughs> thank you for that. Well, what I have before you tonight is, a, is a, I want to establish a grant fund in the amount of $10,000. This money came from the Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, and it was an incentive fund. Um, at, we're, we're a site now where certified application counselors can help people that, that, that can sign up for insurance in the new healthcare marketplace that's set up by the federal government. Um, the incentive was to establish yourself as a site and train at least five people that could be staff or volunteers and you'll get a maximum of $10,000. We currently have about 14 people that are certified application counselor trained. We've got another 10 or so in the pipeline. So we're going to have a couple dozen people in this, in the mix, helping out people in our community. And just uh, for information purposes, um, we'll be opening tomorrow. It'll be our first day, uh, all day Tuesday, walk in. If, if you know somebody that's, that's having trouble with their application or wants to start an application or needs to know if they even qualify for the application, we'll have people on site. Uh, all day tomorrow at the health department. Are there questions for Mr. Connor? How much use have you had of this so far? Well, we'll find out tomorrow. Yeah, so this is going to be your first. It's our very this is first your trial run. It's our very first day. Good luck. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> if there are no further questions, I will accept a motion. Move to approval. Second. <laughs> Clerk, if you'd call the roll. Roll call, Markley. Aye. Walker. Aye. Meadow. Aye. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> All right. Item number two is a presentation and discussion from our election commissioner, Bruce Newby, and um, Jody's uh, up here with him to answer some questions 
Uh, after our visit with Ms. Martin, last standing committee, there were some questions regarding the legalities of the petition request that came before us. So we have um, Mr. Newby and our legal staff here to uh, brief us on those issues, and you also had a memo in your packet. So thank okay. you for being here. I'd um, just like to say Bruce's memo was so thorough and answered most of the legal questions, I think. So I think I'll let him answer it. I agree with his legal conclusions. And if you have further questions, I'm here to answer. Would you just give sort of a very brief summary of your memo for those that are here in the audience and that are watching on television that might not have access to the paper version? Yes. The paper that I presented to you that's in your packets is basically divided into two parts. The first part addresses special elections, and the second part addresses petitions. Special ele elections exist for the purpose of posing specific questions to voters. Special elections are also referred to as question submitted elections. Special elections are commonly used for things like a school bond election, sales tax elections, and obtaining for voter approval for such things as gaming. There are always a yes no question. There is no provision in Kansas law for the election of a person to elective office to fill a vacancy. From U.S. Senator to City Council, the method prescribed for filling a vacancy is always by appointment or selection by the governing body of the affected jurisdiction. Special elections are not used for filling elective position vacancies. Although special elections can be accomplished in four months or less, a regular election usually takes six months or more to plan and execute. Elections are expensive. The cost can range from $10,000 to $500,000, depending on the jurisdiction and the scope of the proposed election. For example, the school bond election that affects as few as 6,000 voters may cost $10,000, while a presidential election involving all 85,000 voters in our county can, ex can be in the vicinity of $500,000. I'd estimate it on your packet that an election, if we, if we were even we could legally do so, an election of the nature that's being asked for in this position would probably cost about $250,000. Petitions, shifting to that. They're a mechanism whereby voters can show their support of a particular issue. Kansas law defines the purpose and use of petitions. The various laws governing petitions define the requirements and formats for a petition to be considered valid. The petitions for which there is a statutory basis include protest petitions, statutory initiative petitions, candidate petitions, recall petitions, political party recognition petitions, and grand jury petitions. By example, copies of a repeal, I've brought copies of a, of a recall petition and what it looks like. Uh, I've described in the packet what the, the required elements of a petition. Uh, note that petitions minimally require the signature, printed name, and address of the petition signer and the date the petition was signed. Each petition page must contain an affidavit completed by the petition circulator and it must be notarized. The Kansas law authorizing petition prescribes the number of persons who must sign the petition for it to be valid. The number of petition signers varies depending on the type of petition specified in the law. For example, the statutory initiative petition, which I cover in your packet, would require 4,224 signatures, or 25% of the number of voters voting in the last general election. A grand jury petition would require 100 plus 2% of the number of votes cast for governor in the last election and that number would sit at 746. A recall petition requires not less than 40% of the votes cast for all candidates for the office. If we were talking about the mayor office and a recall petition for that, that would require 6,758 valid signatures. Um, there's no statutory authority to do an election and the petition does not meet the requirements of law. So <laughs> that's the problem. Questions for Mr. Newby? We, um, we, did receive <laughs> we did receive a letter from a community member, and clerk, if you didn't get a copy, I can certainly provide one to you to include in the minute, minutes. Um, Ms. Martin supplied a letter to us um, noting her understanding that this is, uh, that her petition is likely not legally sound and um, just providing some feedback for the commission. So that will we'll, we'll go into our meeting minutes. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Um, do with you being the election commissioner, 
do you have uh, any suggestions that maybe we can take as a commission in regards to, uh, uh, you know, filling this position? And what is your thought that we leave this seat vacant for 20 months? Is that a good thing, or what are some of the suggestions that you may have? Well, right now the position's already been vacant for 10 months. By the time we were to hold an election of this magnitude, if an election were even possible, we're probably looking at June or July or August before the person could be named for that position. And the position, the position is back up on the ballot in uh, February and April of 2015. So that person would effectively hold office for less than eight months. And if, obviously if they were appointed to it, they'd have to immediately start campaigning for the, for the next election. So in terms of cost, in terms of being able to structure this to give any candidate a viable opportunity to run for the office, the time's just not there. And I thank you, and I understand that from an election standpoint, all of the things that come with hosting an election and running an election, it takes time and, and money. Uh, but, but I do, as um, a representative of the 4th District who does not have an at-large commissioner to work with, I do find it um, somewhat, you know, strange that, you know, certain uh, people and citizens in the community would go without fair representation um, for any amount of time, be it eight months, be it seven months. So that's, that's something that I wanted to express. Um, I really appreciate what Ms. Martin has done. She just took it upon herself. She wanted fair representation. She didn't just talk about it. She went door to door and got petition signatures. And even though it may not have been done the right way, she still put in effort. And I get the calls. I don't know about other people, but they get, I get the calls about people that are concerned about being taxed like every other citizen in this community, but not having the fair representation of everybody in this community. So that is something that I just wanted to address. And that's why it's something that I've, I've went, you know, very, very hard on in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the last two or three months because I wanted to know where do we stand and if we don't have, if people don't have the fair chance to vote or the fair chance for representation, then I don't know what government is for. And I, I thought that's what government was about. So. Mm -hmm. And, and I understand could, and appreciate what you say. You. Maintain yeah. decorum. I appreciate yeah. that. More questions for Mr. Newby? Thank you. It was a very thorough memo, so we appreciate your research. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, anything else on that? <laughs> we will move along to our goals and outcomes. The list that you see in your packet is the list of uh, education goals that we discussed several meetings ago. Um, I provided you a draft of this language last meeting. So today, what I'm looking for is for us to review these goals. Uh, if anyone has changes or thoughts on the exact language, um, today would be a great time to express that. And if not, I'm looking for us to adopt these goals with regard to workforce development. So comments on the goals drafted. And staff, obviously, if you have comments, you are welcome to jump in as well. Now would be your time to <laughs> speak now or forever hold your peace. That's what I say. Jane? I'm, I'm pulling it up. I'm okay. fighting with it here. <laughs> it's talking to me. Well, you're looking at can I say something? Yes, please. I'm already meeting with uh, Lyndale County, the KCK School District, Cynthia Lane, and uh, the superintendent of the Piper School District, uh, uh, Tim Conrad, on a regular basis. And it gives us an opportunity to talk about things that they're concerned about that affect both the unified government and the school districts. So I think that's outstanding that, that we would do that across the board. And, and I think it's a, uh, we're headed in the right direction. I like the idea of, of uh, talking with the Kansas City, Kansas Community College. Actually, we have Mary Ann Flunder here tonight, you know, and, and talk to them about the, the challenges that they have so everyone understands, you know, when, when they're going through a process that there's more than just the unified government involved in the process. Okay, Jane. Could you say a little bit about the last one, the research and identify? So um, the idea is that we have certain programs in our community that we're particularly proud of or that we think are sort of, um, sort of, 
star, well, star programs, that's the way I would say it, star programs, things we're very proud of or that we think are unique to our community. So I think uh, as we're going out and we're talking to people who might bring businesses into our community, if we can match those businesses with a program that we think is particularly good that comes out of our community, we have a better case, right? So I think our goal should be to identify those programs. For instance, I'll say Turner has always been particularly proud of their auto tech program, and they that's sort of their star program, their star tech program in their school. So I think if we can be aware of those programs that we would identify as standout programs, then when somebody comes into our community and says, I'm looking for this type of worker, we have a, a better case if we can point them in the direction of this program that's maybe a standout or maybe a little more specialized. So I would want us uh, as a commission and our staff as well, because they might are aware of probably more programs than we are, to be able to identify those so that we can use that in our marketing efforts. Um, as my husband always points out, our community college is one of the only ones in the area that has a, a mortuary science program. So there you go. Um, it's a standout just because it's unique to the area. So. That's my thought. If you think that can be worded better to no, get that I'm point across, I would. I'm not worried about the wording. I just wanted to make sure. You were what, on yeah, the same page. I to <laughs> yes, I want to understand the concept overall that you were thinking about. Move we adopt the goals as written. Second. I have a motion and a second. Clerk, would you read the roll? Roll call. Markley? Aye. Walker? Aye. 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 That brings us to the end of our agenda, so this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you for those who attended as well. In our new conference room. Very exciting.